As we explained yesterday was that um, everybody had yes, I think everybody was here yesterday. We explained yesterday was that <coughs> what is the clipper of Yuvanim, which means that the people who uh, persecuted us, the nation of Yuvanim, were human beings who were anti-Semitic and they were fighting to defeat us and force us to take on their culture, but it was coming from a higher place. And that is that there was a certain clipper invested in their bodies. And that clipper was the real driving force for them doing what they did. It's like the Gashmias, if a person has some sort of symptom in their body, there's a rash, something hurts, something turns red, something turns blue. It's not, you know, if, it, if a child goes to a doctor and he hears the doctor telling the mother, this is red and, and it's very swollen, you must immediately go to the emergency room. So the child is saying, this doctor hates the color red. You see what happened? He saw that it's red and he said, you have to get rid of it immediately. He hates the color red. No, he doesn't hate the color red. The red is a symptom, an indication that there's something inside that's dangerous. And the same is here. Thank you. <clears throat> that when we, thank you. When we see that there is a, um, a nation that's trying to destroy us, there's a reason for it. There's a clip inside the nation, just like Bagashman did, germs, bacteria, different kinds of germs. This is uh, different kinds of infections. This is sort of a spiritual infection called the klipa of Yuvanim, and that's inside these people. And that's the driving force to them doing what they're doing. And that's what we need to understand, what is the klipa, because all of us could have that klipa in us in a smaller scale. So we said the klipa is that we should be passionate about the seichel, the intellect, the logic that's found in Judaism or the logic that's found in Torah and not in the godliness that's there. So to go back to the list that I gave you, first of all, I just want to point out uh, that I'm gonna check off this list as we go along, what are the things that we explained? So one of the things is number 17. What and number 15. Number 15 is Chokmas Yavan. Again, the Yavanim were philosophical. They were into philosophy and intelligence, and that was part of their uh, culture, and that's what they were promoting. And if citizen calls this Chokma the Klippa. So remember, everything that's in Gedusha, Hashem created a counterpart for Klippa. If Kedusha has Chokma, Klippa has Chokma. Kedusha has Chesed, Klippa has Chesed. So Yavon is Chokma, has Chokma Klippa. And that's what we have to fight. So the question is, how do you fight Chokma Klippa? You would think to promote Chokma Kedusha. But the truth is, it's not enough because this is Chokhmah and that's Chokhmah. And therefore, it's very easy that the Chokhmah of Klippa should stand in the way of Chokhmah of Kedusha. So you need something higher than Chokhmah of Kedusha. And with that power and that force, you can melt and destroy completely Chokhmah of Klippa. And what is that power? So that is, we have to connect to Hashem as he is higher than Chochmah. So again, if you're learning Torah and you're focusing on Hashem, how he's invested in Chochmah, in wisdom. So Klippa comes along and says, I also have wisdom. I also have intellect. And I think you're supposed to do things this way, that way. And there's something there that challenges us, gets in the way because we're dealing with Seichel, logic and intellect. And in fact, every single thing that there's in Torah, you can find a logical explanation to do the opposite. I remember the Rebbe once gave an example 
of Kibidav Ein. What could be more logical than honoring parents? They're the ones that brought me to the world. They're the ones that raised me. They're the ones that gave me everything I have. <clears throat> Since I'm a little child, that when I need to be taken care of every second, and it makes only sense. It only makes sense that I should be honoring them. So today, people come along and say, "My parents, they didn't do anything for me." What do you mean? No, they did that for themselves. Parents, by nature, love their children. So they want to feel good. So therefore, they make the children happy so they should feel good. They don't let the children cry so they should feel good. They give the children education so they'll later be proud. Oh, my child got a college education, became a doctor and a lawyer. So if you just go with pure logic, you can find a logical explanation for everything and anything that would lead to against the logic of Torah. So the Chochmah of Klippa is a very, very strong Klippa. And the only way to overcome it is with drawing down something that's higher than wisdom, which is the infinite light of Hashem in self. And on a personal level, it means I have to tap into the part in me that's deeper than seichel, deeper than intellect. <clears throat> and of course, what is that? That's the yechida. That's the part of my neshama that's higher than intellect. It's pure godliness. It's infinite uh, light of Hashem is inside me. And with that power, I could really overcome even Chachma of Klippa. So this is the reason why what was necessary in order to fight the Yavonim was Mesiris Nefesh. If you think of what happened uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with the time of Hanukkah, the Chashmanoim who were fighting the Yavonim literally had Mesiris Nefesh because it was not logical and you couldn't expect it if you would approach it logical and according to the laws of nature that this small group of people should be able to overcome the 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 the, um, the 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 powerful army of the of the Yavani. So how did they do it? How could they go to war? Remember, I told you Rashi says there were twelve people in the Hashmanayim, and they stood up against. Uh, this would be like you know, like they had in Russia the um, partisans, twelve partisans, and they're fighting an army of eighty thousand people. Al Piteva, there's no way in the world it can happen. The answer is they weren't judging things logically. They aroused the ichid of their neshama, which is dedicated to Hashem in a way which is unlimited, unconditional, unquestionable. It's the deepest part of the neshama. And with that power, they went to fight and they tackle won the war because they did that. So basically, what they had was mysterious nefesh. Mysterious nefesh means dedication to Hashem that comes from a place that's beyond logic. And that was the Aveda of the Hashmanai. So this explains a few things. One thing is number eight. Remember, we said that they found one jug of oil and <clears throat> it wasn't enough to light for eight days, and eventually it's for eight days. What's the remez? What's what's hinted in this fact that it says they found one jug of oil with the seal of the Kohen God? So this is what it means. They brought impurity into the Jewish people. And that's why so many thousands of Jews became Hellenists. But the, just like in the Beis Hamikdash, they made everything impure. Rashad showed this miracle. According to some opinions, the, the bottle of oil rolled down on the floor and they didn't notice it. It was under one of the boards uh, of the floor under the, or hidden in the sand of the floor. And that's how they found it. But what really it means is that there's always a place in the neshama v'yid that no impurity in the world could get to it. It'll always remain pure. And that's the, what it means when it says they found only a small jug of oil. It means no matter how impure a person might be, you'll always be able to find a small jug of oil in that person that's pure. And no impurity even touched it. In fact, this explains another thing. We understand why they had to find it with a seal because the seal is an indication that nobody touched it and made it impure. But how come Hashem made it as the seal of the Kohen Gadol? Couldn't it be a seal of a regular Kohen? Do the same thing. As long as it has a seal and the seal wasn't broken, that's a sign that it's pure. 
So the answer is because we're <coughs> bringing out here that in this time of darkness, the yechida, the essence of the neshama is revealed. So just like with each Jew, there are different levels of the neshama, and the yechida is the highest level. So too, in the Jewish nation, there are different levels of holiness. Every yid is a goy kardash, is part of a holy nation. But there's a difference between a Yisrael, a Levi, and a Kohen. And in the, in the category of Kohen, the highest level of Kedusha, and this is the one who has the most stringent details of Halacha, is a Kohen God of the high priest. So the Kohen God in the, in the Jewish nation represents the Yechida of the general soul of you. And that's what it means that we found one jug of oil and that had the seal of the Kohen Gadol on it. <clears throat> so this also explains the original question, how come that the, the Yantav is commemorated with lighting the menorah and the candles? Why not commemorating the war and doing something to show that we're thanking Hashem that we won the war. And the answer is being that this is mainly a spiritual war. So we think that because they won the war, they're able to light the menorah. It's actually just the opposite. Because they won the spiritual war, because they came out with their mysterious nefesh for Hashem, that no matter how strong the other side is, they're not going to let themselves be affected or bend by it or in, in, in became, become impure because of it. So therefore, they won the war in a spiritual way. And that's what led that they should win the war in a physical way. So that's why it's Dafka commemorating the things that are more spiritual, which is fire represents spirituality. First of all, the Nishama is represented by fire. Neir Hashem, Nishmas Adam. It's a Pasuk. The candle of Hashem is the Nishama of a man. There's another Pasuk, Neir Mitzvah, the Torah Er. A Neir Mitzvah is compared to a candle, and Torah is compared to light. And Hashem himself is also compared to fire. Ki Hashem elokecha, eish eich lahu, Hashem your God is a consuming fire. When Hashem appeared to Moshe Rabbeinu the first time, it was in the form of a fire. And I think we once explained this, why is fire so much the symbol of spirituality? Anyone remember? I'm not sure I was in this class, so I was checking. It always goes up. That's a nice explanation. What? Say it in English. Yeah. So what is what does that have to do with the price of fish? You're right, by the way. That's the answer. Well, what is how does it answer the question? No, so let me. So, what, what Maya is saying is that out of the four elements, is the only one. Like, if you take water out of a cup, you have less water in the cup. If you take sand out of the earth, there's less sand in the earth. If you take air out of the room, today we know ways of taking air out of a room, there's less air in the room. Fire, you can take one candle and light hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of candles, and the original flame doesn't become any less. What does that mean? It means it's not so physical. It does not have physical features and physical limitations. That's what it means. So the, the fact that you have something that you can draw from it and draw from it and draw from it, and it doesn't get less, means it's not so much bound to the physical uh, laws of nature. So in a sense, we can say that fire is one of the four elements. It's physical because you can see it, but it's closer. It's like the most borderline spiritual. So therefore, what is the, what is, which of the four elements represent spirituality? It's fire. And you're right, there are many more reasons. The whole chapter in Tanya that gives another reason why the Nisham is compared to a, to a fire, chapter 19. So, but definitely from all the different sources, the uh, fire, the candles, all represent spirituality. And that was the real war. And that's why that's the main uh, way of celebrating Hanukkah, because this was a spiritual victory.
This explains another thing. Let's look at number 10. Mahadrin and Mahadrin. When we learned the Gemara, we saw something interesting, that the Gemara says that the initial mitzvah of Hanukkah is just one candle for the whole family. But if you want to do the mitzvah Mahadrin, which means you want to go beyond the letter of the law, you can light one candle for every member of the family. And if you want to do Mahadrin, Mina Mahadrin, beyond the law, beyond the law, then you light every night an extra candle. What? Mm-hmm. Meaning what? The way we do it today is Mahadrim and Mahadrim. Oh, okay. But it's brought down in Shulchan Aruch that today, Shulchan Aruch was already written also 400 years ago. And so today means then. Today, if a person would say, oh, that's the halacha, I'll just light one candle. It's not acceptable. Because it already became the minig, the custom, that all Jews light like Mahadrim and Mahadrim more and more, which means every night, another additional candle. So that's a little bit strange. Generally speaking, people observe mitzvahs on the sort of the average level. Then there are people that are maybe more uh, righteous, they're more God-fearing, they're on a higher level. They, they do mahadu. And then there are people that are really exceptional and they'll go beyond, beyond the letter of the law. And over here, everybody, every single person follows this level beyond the letter of the law. By the way, we'll learn about this, oh, no, we learned about this last year with this class, but we have a class here, which is called Hasidic Way of Life, which we'll start a little bit later in the year. And one of the things that comes up is one of the, one of the things that define a chassid is the Pnim Meshur Zadin. The chassidim go beyond the letter of the law. And this is one of the things that those who are against chassidim argued that it's wrong. Going beyond the letter of the law is not for every single person. If a regular person goes beyond the letter of the law, it's like being arrogant. Who do you think you are? Just do the mitzvah, that's fine. So going beyond the letter of the law, that is for people who are on a higher level of God-fearing people, and they go beyond the letter of the law. So certainly when you're talking about beyond, beyond, and Hanukkah is an interesting thing, it became the mitzvah that everybody follows the level of Mahadrim and Mahadrim. So this is the answer. Generally speaking, when we do mitzvahs, we involve our nefesh, ruach, and neshama. That's the general status of a neshama. When we go beyond the letter of the law, that means I'm serving Hashem with something deeper, with chaya, with the fourth level of the neshama. And when I'm going beyond, beyond, that's a person that the yichida is sort of open, and the yichida is revealed, and then he observes mitzvahs on that higher level. So being that Hanukkah is the time, and that's what Hanukkah is all about, this is the time where the yichida was revealed, and with that power, and only with that power, can we defeat Chachma of Klippa. So therefore, during this time, what is it that, that we how it was accepted by all Jews, even people today who like the uh, who don't really light a menorah, they're not so from, they light a, an electric menorah, just symbolic. They also light every night an extra candle. Why? Because this is Yechidah. And Yechidah every year has, and that's something which every person is, is in that place. And that's what happens on Hanukkah. <clears throat> Following this, um, <clears throat> we can go into three things now that we spoke about. Number one, why was it lit? Why is the menorah supposed to be lit dafka after it gets dark? Number two, why is it lit dafka outside? And number three, why is it lit on the left side? Everything in Torah is always the right side. So the answer is that we know that it's a little bit similar to what we learned about when we spoke about this yearness, about tests. That generally speaking, the way you elevate Klippa is you don't really elevate Klippa. You just reject it. You stay away from it. By not eating tray food, <clears throat> that's how it gets elevated. By not wearing something which is shotness, that's how it gets elevated. By not doing Malachan Shabbos, that's how this object 
gets elevated. But we don't really directly do something to elevate the klipa. In that sense, Hanukkah is different. Hanukkah is a very powerful yanta where the Echid is revealed. Something is revealed that's unlimited, that's higher than intellect, higher than nature, as we'll so see. And with that power, we're able to directly light up and bring light into the world of Klippa. So generally speaking, inside and outside represents Kedusha and Klippa. Outside means outside of the realm of Kedusha. In fact, one of the names for Klippa in Tanya is Sitra Achra. What does Sitra Achra mean? The other side, outside. So we like it outside. What is the difference between the right and the left? Also, generally speaking, the right is Kedusha and the left is the other side. And the same thing is with the darkness and the light. So because Hanukkah is different than the menorah in the base of English, the menorah in the base of English was about lighting light inside. And that light went to the rest of the world. The Hanukkah menorah is directly beaming to the outside. And that's why we're supposed to be lit outside when it's dark on the left side in order to elevate Klippa in a way like no other commandment elevates Klippa. And the way we were able to achieve this was through Mesir Snefesh. I usually bring this into school, so I'll hopefully remember to bring it next week on Hanukkah. Those who were here last year saw it. And I once met someone through the whole story of Hedgacha Pratis. And this person, <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, he was all alone. He had family, but he believed that his family is not going to value anything that he has as Jewish. He was older and he was worried what's going to happen with his, these things, what are precious to him. And he gave them to me two things. One was a Tanakh that he got in the Israeli army. And the other one was a gift that the Israeli army gave him. What was the gift? I have to show you, you should see it, it's very interesting. It's a menorah, but the menorah is made out of a rifle. It's the butt of the rifle, this part, which you hold in your hand. On top is eight, place for eight candles. The thing that's the eight candles is made out of bullets. And the menorah could stand like this, that comes from a cannon. The thing that it's standing on is from a cannon. So basically, it's a cute thing, but really, I know they realized they actually did something which represents the whole idea of Hanukkah menorah. And that is to take the outside and transform it into light. So you take something like a rifle, I think it was even a German rifle, which means that it is made to destroy life. And they are using it for menorah to bring light and life into the world. And that's another thing, a deeper meaning to number 11. Remember we said number 11, the Gemara says, how late could you like the menorah? Adekalya, rigla the tamadoi. Until you no longer see the feet of the tribe called tamadoi. So, first of all, kalya means ends. It finishes. It's no longer there. Uh, let me just show you the word. This is the word tamadoi. Tav, reish, mem, Valid, Aleph, you. So it says a chsidus that you take out these letters and rearrange them. You have a mem, a vav, a range, a dalin, and a sub. What does it spell? Moredit. Moredit means a woman who rebels against her husband. We're on a higher scale, a year that rebels against Hashem is called Moredis. At the Kalyo regular time of you have to light the candle to bring so much light into the street that there's no longer anything that is Moredis, that's rebellion against Hashem. We actually see in our generation, one of the biggest Miftzayim of the Rebbe is Miftzah Hanukkah. Hanukkah candles are lit literally from one end of the world to the other end of the world. And it, it, it's, it's beyond, it's, it's just beyond comprehension how many thousands of people got warmed up and excited to Yiddishkeit through the menorah. 
they saw the menorah, and somehow it made them identify maybe with their childhood. That's the, that's the psychological reason. But the real reason is because the menorah of Hanukkah has something to do with touching the Yechida. I know someone who lives in, he told me, he lives in Melbourne, but he saw on the television the lighting of the menorah in another country, and that got him excited. <laughs> so they, and that changed his life. So basically, the purpose of the menorah is it should be lit until we finally will turn the whole darkness of the world into light. That's, that's the ultimate purpose. In fact, the Rebbe insisted that in every country, they should try to see the menorah should be lit, like in the United States, near the White House, near the building of the governments in different cities or different countries, because the purpose of menorah is not just to light up the Jewish show, but light up the streets, to light up the darkness, to reach the nations of the world, and to light up everything out there that's dark. So this explains number four, which is why the menorah is on the left. This explains number 11. Of course, the Rebbe says, what does it mean, kal yorigla that the, you don't see the feet, which means that there's no remnants left of anything that rebels against Hashem. All the yidn, all the non Jews, everything in the world will be consistent with Hashem's will, and there won't any longer be anything else. What? Okay. So I want to touch on another subject now. Of course, it's all related, but how do you like the menorah? So we said that as um, a machlekes and gemara, Beishame says that you light every night a different number, but you go down. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Beis Hillel says you go up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Beis Hillel's reason is because Kedusha, you don't go down. You only go up. And by the way, this is not just a, um, a thought, a, a, a Torah thought. It actually has halachic ramifications. That an object that you use for something of Kedusha, in certain cases, you're not allowed to use it anymore for personal use because you use it for Kedusha. Let's say you have the straps of twillin that was used for twillin. You can't use them later for something else. Or even in the twillin itself, you have two boxes. One box is for the head, one box is for the hand. If you want to switch and take the box that was made for the head and work it out and use it for the hand, you can't because the head has more kedusha than the hand. And there are actually halachas that you mine the kedush in kedusha. You go up and you don't go down. So the question is, what's Beishamai? What does he say? How could he say such a thing that you go every day less? But Beishamai says, I have a source. It says in the Chumash that when they brought the Pari Hachag, that's what they did. So first of all, based on what we just explained, now we can see the connection between Hanukkah and the 70 bulls. What was the 70 bulls about? It was from 70 nations. In other words, the purpose of these korbanas was to bring light to the nations of the world. All the korbanas was to bring light into the base of English and to us. And this one thing was mainly to bring light to the seven nations. And that's what Hanukkah is about, to bringing light into the street, into the world of Klippa, and to light up and transform Klippa. So what's the opinion of, of, of Beis Hillel? So first of all, look at number one, you'll see something of the, uh, nice, and that is, you see the first thing, what does it say? Eight candles. Chet Nerot, eight candles, and Allah is like Beisilum. If you look at it, you'll see the first letter is spells Hanukkah. Chet, Nun, Vav, Chav, Hei. So the word Hanukkah says eight candles, and Allah is like Beisilum. But still, the Shammai is an opinion in Torah. What is, what is it? How do you explain it? So the answer is like this. I once saw a letter from the Rebbe 
a woman wrote to the Rebbe that her son became religious and clearly she wasn't too excited about it. On top of that, guess what else happened? He grew a beard. When a girl becomes religious, not so terrible. She looks more or less the same, a little bit more to his clothing, but otherwise it's the same person. A man starts growing a beard, that's really frightening for somebody who doesn't really appreciate it. So she writes to the Rebbe, and I know my son listens to you very much. And I did my research and I found out that you could be 100% religious without a beard. So I'm asking you to please influence my son to take off his beard. Now the Rebbe didn't just write back, I'm sorry, this is the way it is, and it's too bad. The Rebbe gave a very beautiful explanation. And he used the following analogy. If you have a building, it has five stories. No, a building has four stories. It's a perfect building. It's a beautiful building. It's not missing anything. It's four stories high. But what if you have a building that has five stories, and then you take a bulldozer to knock down the top floor? Bulldozer to knock down the top floor. Then, first of all, you make the whole building shake, and it could even be that you affect the foundation of the entire building by doing that. What does it mean? The person is a, a Jew that observed Torah mitzvahs. And he doesn't take on to let his beard grow. The Yiddish guy is a perfect, 100% observant Jew. But if a person took it on and added this to his building, and then you're forcing him to take it down, you should know that not only you're causing this whole Yiddish guy to be shook up, you could even be affecting the very foundation of his Yiddish guy. Because once it starts going down, then and then it could lead to chas uh, v'shalom, everything being changed. In Gemara, there's a, uh, a halacha regarding wars. There's a whole section of halacha, how Jews go to war. And one of them is that you're not allowed to back out once you're going into the war, because if you back out, you're causing everybody to be afraid. But the Lashon in Gemara like this, tchilas nefila nisa. The beginning of, I think in English it also rhymes, the beginning of defeat is retreat. When you go back, that's the beginning of defeat. When the enemy sees you're backing off, they attack stronger. So when the Yetzirah sees that I did this, 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 and I'm stopping, that could lead to much worse consequences. So in Gedusha, you don't go down, you only go up. You can stand in one place, but definitely not to go down. So the answer like this, both Misham and Misalo are both into um, uh, uh, the same thing, which is to go up in Kedusha, and nevertheless, one represents going up by making more candles, and one represents going up by making less candles. How's that? So the answer is as follows. In general, there are two approaches of how to deal with negative things, which has come up in class before. If you want to use a, an analogy of something physical, the analogy would be Sometimes we use fire, I mean, light and darkness as an analogy. Light is positive and darkness is light and darkness is negative. And you need light to get rid of the darkness. Sometimes we use another analogy. And that analogy is if there's a room that there's a lot of filth and dirt and garbage, then you have to clean the garbage, clean all of the filth and the dirt, get it out of the house, and only then could you go ahead and bring in nice furniture and make it into a beautiful room. But it doesn't make sense to bring in beautiful furniture on top of the garbage and all the filth and the dirt that's there. But Ruchni is these are two approaches. Do we first have to get rid of the negativity and then work on bringing in the good? Or could we bring in the good and the negativity will be sort of moved out of the way? So Bagashmi is these are two possibilities, two scenarios. When it's light and darkness, I don't engage with the darkness. I'm engaging with the light. I take a candle and I light it and I bring it into the room and the darkness goes away by itself. But when you want to clean up a house, you are doing that. You're taking a, a rug, you're taking a, a, a rag and you're taking a vacuum cleaner and you're taking a broom and other tools and you're cleaning the garbage and dealing with the garbage. So Baruchnis, these are two approaches in Ruchnis, how to deal with, with Klippa and Kedusha. <clears throat> this is the difference between Bishamah and Beshilo. Bishamah was Gevura, Beshilo was Chesed. 
So Beis Hillel's his opinion is that you deal with light. Don't deal with the darkness. So therefore, if we have to go up every day, so the first night we have one candle of light, and the second night we have two candles of light, and the third night three candles of light, because you have to move forward. The Shammai is, no, we have to deal directly with the darkness and get rid of the darkness. That's what we're working on. Get rid of the darkness. So after the first night that I got rid of the darkness, I have less darkness. If I have less darkness, I don't need so many candles anymore. The third night, I have less darkness, I need less candles. The fourth night, I have less darkness, I need less candles. It's, it's like if, you know, when we talk about what's happening in the world today, one of the signs of Mashiach is, in the 1980s, they started to make smaller armies. They stopped manufacturing weapons. In other words, the Cold War, the war threat and the threat of nuclear weapons was no longer here like it used to be, Russia and America. Once there was no longer a threat, we no longer needed so many armies and so many weapons and began to destroy it. So in other words, if there's less darkness in the world, we need less light. So according to Bishamai, the fact that there's less candles doesn't mean we're going down, it means we're going up. Because there's less darkness, so we need less candles. The only difference is that because Bishama is focused on the negativity, so that's how he measures moving forward. That there's less negativity, and we don't need so many candles. According to Basila, we're not focusing on the negative, only on the positive. So by him, how does that express going forward is lighting new candles every single night? So why in the day of Mashiach we're gonna go? According to Betina, there won't be any more. Remember, when he comes, you'll ask me the question. <laughs> I'll try to give the answer. I don't know the answer. I thought about that question. But the rabbi does say, being that the halacha is like the civil now for us, that means we should follow Basil's approach, which means not engage with the darkness, with the negative, with the flaws, and talk about how bad it is, <laughs> how much punishment it's going to bring. <laughs> on the light and to increase more and more light and then naturally there'll be less less darkness. Now your question what's going to be in the time of Shiach is a very good question. Yes, yes, yes. So the uh, this week we'll be learning my I'll be learning my more about Hanukkah maybe I'll come across something. You're still here till after Hanukkah? Okay so maybe I'll find an answer yes. and I'll give it over. <clears throat> One more question is, Hanukkah teaches us that a person shouldn't stand in one place, but always go forward. First night, one candle, second night, two candles. So these are the words that you have in number three. It says, which means to continue to add in light, not just stand in one place, but to move forward. Every night, more light than the night before. And not to be satisfied with the night light that I had yesterday. <clears throat> and the question is, if a person is going to live that kind of life, they're always going to be depressed. I learned something, I'm doing with Swiss. And then he said, not enough, you got to do more. Okay. I do more. Not enough, you got to do more. I do more. Not enough, you got to do more. So how could you not be depressed with such a life? In fact, that's what it says in Prakyavos. And in other places, in Mishlei, <clears throat> Why people are never happy, those who are pursuing materialistic things. Because when you have $100, you want $200. You have $200, you want $400. You have four, you want eight. You're always wanting more and more and more, so you'll never be happy. What does it say about a person? It should be some man with Be happy with what you have. And if you're not happy with what you have, you'll never be happy because there's always more and more. So if I'm going to do the, the, handle and deal that way with Kedusha, I'll also never be happy. Rabbi Greenberg, who teaches here, once told me that he had a guest by a table, and she's one of the biggest people in the world that do handwriting analysis. And she said that they once showed her the Rebbe's handwriting before she knew anything about the Rebbe, the Babich. Just, here's a handwriting, what do you say about it? And she said she was blown away. And one of the reasons were this handwriting shows things that normally this would be by two people, not only opposites, at two ends of the spectrum. 
On one hand, he's never satisfied with what was accomplished. And we saw that by the Rebbe, no matter what happens. I, I remember watching videos. I think they put together a video or something like that. A person walks over and says to the Rebbe, we just built 2,000 houses in this and this place. The Rebbe doesn't jump. The Rebbe doesn't go, wow. Gives him a dollar, gives him another dollar. Next year, you'll have a double as much. <laughs> you don't even get a chance to breathe and a double as much. And no matter what people did, and that's how the Rebbe didn't appreciate what was accomplished. And, and I guess you have to think of it this way. Imagine if chas v'shalom is a fire. And in the fire, a mother is screaming, she has 10 children in the house, and the firemen run in and they grab one child and a second child. And then the fire is getting bigger. They grab, they save nine children. And the 10th child is still there. And the mother is screaming her head off. And the firemen say, well, calm down, we already saved nine children. I mean, one out of 10, please. You think the, the mother would, would, they would eat, those words would make any sense to her? It's a child. Every child is precious. So by the Rebbe, every yid is precious. And therefore, you tell me that you brought 200,000 Jews to Yiddishkeit, but still another million out there that you didn't. And that's the way they ever looked at it. But on the other hand, she saw that this is a person that's happy with such happiness that you can't compare it to anything else. How can happiness and this come together? So the answer is, I'll give you a chance to think of it over Shabbos. <laughs> Both are things that we're supposed to do according to Torah. <clears throat> and yet, how could it go together? Okay, a good Shabbos, everybody. And a Freyl Chanukah. And um, we will, Amir Hashem, continue on Monday, Monday morning. Yeah. Which time are we Um... I think the next one, I didn't look at my list, but I think the next one is Micha Mocha. It's a moment from the Rebbe Marash, I think. But Monday, I'll still be doing Hanukkah, finishing. So maybe Tuesday, we'll start the other moment.